<laughs> so welcome, Anita. Is it okay if I call oh. you Anita? Mm-hmm. Certainly. And um, so when you, so tell us a little bit about, um, so what, what do you want to talk about today? Or how can we help you? Or are you helping us? Or what's going on? Whatever you'd like. I mean, you're welcome to ask me anything you want. A lot of people tend to ask about my condition, and you're totally free to, if you'd like. Um, uh, I, I hear that you have particular expertise with burnout. Um, but yeah. also, like, we can talk, we can touch on a little bit about, um, like, the pressure of uh, being online and, you know, receiving a lot of abuse and kind of, like, prejudices against people with disabilities, if you like, as well, because that's a very loud aspect of my existence that sure. kind of well, I have to kind of try and ignore on a daily basis. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, absolutely. I mean, if there's some way that I can be helpful with you about burnout and that is sort of my, um, I mean, I guess I'm developing a different professional expertise nowadays, but that was sort of my traditional um, area of expertise. So can you tell us a little bit about, um, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and then we can talk about burnout or Sure, I'm Sweetnia. I've been a streamer for about two years now, and uh, I went uh, I went viral pretty much as soon as I hit the ground on Twitch. So I was completely lost, um, and I've been playing catch up ever since um, with a crazy amount of growth. Uh, my stream is mainly variety streaming, um, mostly just chatting, and yeah, I've I've been working on you know mental health topics since I started really because. Thank uh, you for uh, doing that. Yeah, I mean, I kind of feel like the platform really needs it. Um, this is this whole platform feels like a symptom of loneliness. Like people want company. Um, so a lot of the people who come mm. here are people who have eloquent. stuff that they're coping with. Yeah, a symptom of loneliness. I love that. Yeah. So, um, so you're you're whistling. Mm, I, that's a tick. Okay. Uh, and... So I can't help it. And and does your the the right eye blinking that's a tick as well? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're not just uh, wink does it have any amount of winking or it's just a tick? It's it's just a tick. Okay. It gets me in trouble a lot actually, because um, I can't if I go to nightclubs where I can't really explain myself very easily across the room. A lot of people think I'm hitting on them <laughs> um, when I'm really really not. <laughs> yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about ticks and what's up with that? So I have a condition called Tourette syndrome. Uh, a lot of people get symptoms in that early childhood, but my family can remember symptoms coming from about the, at least the age of one. Um, I have involuntary movements and speech, so I'll quite often say things that are inappropriate. If that happens during the stream, I'm very sorry. It's not a reflection of what I'm thinking, and that's a common misconception about Tourette syndrome is that it's what we're secretly thinking or wish we could say. But if it's mostly word salad, you don't know what's going to get tossed up. If it's relevant to the situation at all, and sometimes it is, it's usually because I'm worried about saying it rather than because it's actually what I'm thinking or feeling. Um, because worrying about it being inappropriate quite often forces you to be inappropriate as someone with Tourette's, which can be very unfortunate and dangerous in public. Uh, but luckily, slightly less dangerous if you, you know, have an internet based job where, you know, even <laughs> people get cross with you, they can't do anything about it, luckily. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, hmm. and, and so tell me, do you, have you noticed that some things make your tics better or worse? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, I think that's the case for a lot of people with Tourette syndrome, uh, making music. Definitely. Definitely. A lot of people with even severe Tourette syndrome have, um, can, can sing without tics or perhaps play an instrument without having any tics hmm. at all. Um, there are lots of things. A lot of people ask if I tick during sex. And I've, I, this is a question I ask a lot of people who also have Tourette syndrome across the board. If, if the sex is good, no. So, because <laughs> um, hmm. focus, um, if you're enjoying something and it requires a lot of focus and you're very much engaged with what you're doing, you, it definitely reduces the ticks. Um, so there's lots of, yeah, there's lots of things um, that do reduce the ticks. Exercise, things like that. I don't tick as much around my personal trainer. Um, so he's quite shocked when he sees videos of me. <laughs> um, hmm. Yeah, so yeah, definitely. And there are things that exacerbate it too, like high stress situations, high emotion, feelings of awkwardness. My biggest trigger is awkwardness. Um, so I can't watch Mr. Bean quietly, that's for sure. <laughs> Mr. Bean is amazing. He is. <laughs> um, so stress, and, and what about burnout? So I have always 
I used to be agoraphobic, so my life was really still for a while, and I think that was the worst thing I ever experienced, honestly. So I have always been chasing things to do, um, and I can never say no. And even before I started streaming, it was a bit of a problem because I used to run a business. I used to care for my mom. I used to care for rescue animals and I used to do rescue volunteering. And the four of them put together, sometimes I'd come home for an hour and then go straight back out again. And I would do that for days on end, um, you know, and I would like fall asleep at work and then I'd fall asleep in the car on the way to rescue work and I would just never stop. Why and when think... I started doing... What's that what about? What do you think that is? Um... I don't know. I mean, uh, 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 I definitely have an aversion to sitting still. I definitely have an aversion to uh, uh, to um, stopping for anything. And I'm not very good at attending to my needs. So I quite often forget to um, make myself food or get to sleep or take time for me. Um, I feel guilty when I do those things. So I feel much better when I'm getting on with stuff, actually doing something productive and worthwhile. Hmm. You feel guilty for attending to your needs? Yeah, definitely. Like playing games or just, you know, just taking a minute to just sit in the garden or whatever. I'm, I feel this like encroaching sense of dick. Um, encro encroaching sense of, um, like, I'm wasting my time. There's things that need to be done. I'm letting everything slip out of my hands and I've got to get back to it now sort of thing. How long have you been feeling that way? I don't know. I think e e e e I think it probably started when I stopped being able to go outside. Back when I got too scared to go outside and I was fully agoraphobic, I stayed away from everyone, didn't really speak to anyone for years. And during that time, I used to look out the window and see the summers rolling by and know that this was the best time of my life. Summers, yeah. So like years. Multiple summers, yes. Wow. And so I used to used to feel terrible, like I was wasting the best time of my life. Hmm. And um, do you, so can you tell us a little bit about when you became, as you put it, fully agoraphobic? I, I went, I, 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 ah, uh, I try, I, I was, ah, uh, I was really young, um, pestering my mom to go, let me to go back to school because I was starting to feel a bit lonely and I wanted to reach out to other what, kids. Why um, weren't you in school? Uh, we, we, we moved around a lot. Um, and even when we were still, I, I wasn't, I, we always went, we didn't always have a home. Sometimes we were homeless and things were just challenging. Um, my mom needed looking after and so did our rescue animals. And so there wasn't really much space for me to get a formal, huh, formal education. Huh. So I, I started to get a bit lonely and I started to want to go to school. But then I did go to school and even though I was doing well academically, right off the bat, I wasn't doing so well trying to integrate. I had these symptoms, but no explanation for them. So I was coming across as a bit weird. And it's not always easy to fit in when you're a bit weird. And yeah, some, some, pretty, some pretty bad stuff happened. So I kind of withdrew again, um, but the aggression didn't stop. And, you know. What do you mean um, the aggression? It, so my uh uh my uh uh my last day of school um I was thirteen oh. and my uh four I think it was four six formers, I don't know how old they are, the oldest kids at our school basically, um beat me until I was unconscious. Holy and shit. There wasn't much I could do about it. So I woke up in the, in the, in the, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, I woke up in the, in the, in the, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, in the health bit. I've forgotten the name for it. The, the met, first aid, there we go, first aid place with their, like, on-site doctor person. And that was my last day. I was like, I can't do this anymore. I mean, it's not safe for me to learn here. It's not going to stop. So I left. But I had a paper route and the kids from that same school would continue to harass me, throwing stones at me. I'd come home bleeding. Um, they'd egg my house and they'd constantly ridicule me. So there wasn't really anything I could do to escape it. It just followed me everywhere and my world just shrank and shrank. I gave up my paper round. I gave up going outside and just even opening the front door started to give me a bit of a heart attack. So people didn't take my ticks well. People didn't, you know, there was... 
there was a lot of stuff going on that just I couldn't really change or contend with. So, so I just withdrew. Wow. That sounds awful. That just sounds honestly kind of insane. Like I've never heard of a 13 year old being beaten into unconsciousness, nor have I heard of someone who like has a paper route who gets like thro stones thrown at them. I mean, it, it sounds like you were hunted. Yeah, well, uh, it's, it's not always easy to explain yourself if you don't have a diagnosis. I used to wonder myself, I would do all these inappropriate things and then go, why am I such a terrible person? Because I didn't have, I would pinch people on the back of the arm or punch them on the arm and not want to and not understand why. And they might be, I used to get kicked off buses and things like that. And it just became very difficult to get out and now do anything. Because when people asked why, I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so yeah, my world shrank and I stayed in all day. And the nights and days blurred into one. Uh I didn't, uh, I didn't go outside. I didn't have anything new. So I was playing the same games over and over again. And my, mm -mm -mm, yeah, I didn't really speak to my mom a lot. She was very, very ill. She spent most of her time in bed. The house was always quiet. So there wasn't really mm, mm, much going on. I need, I'm going to say something that may be a little bit inflammatory, but I, like, it's honestly the, the thought that pops into my head. Mm. How on earth are you not way more fucked up? Uh, you're not the first therapist to ask me that, actually. Just, um, I've had four in my life, and yeah, all of them have asked me that. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I'm not like, I, I mean, you, you come across as, as, you know, introspective, patient, intelligent. I mean, th these are all the things that I'm feeling from you, compassionate, um, you know, aware of your internal state uh, to a certain degree, acceptance, which is a lot of what we talk about today. And, and like, I'm telling you, I've seen people who are way more fucked up than you who have had way easier lives and like consistently, <laughs> right? I mean, usually it doesn't, it doesn't take a whole lot to fuck up a child and that's really sad. Like it doesn't take yeah. a whole lot to really mess up a kid. And, <laughs> and what I'm hearing from you, like, I'm just really, really stunned to be honest. Like, so there, you know, there's one part of it is like, you know, all the frankly abuse that you went to, but then you're also talking about a mom who's kind of disabled from a young yeah. age and, and kind of being left to your own devices. Mm -hmm. And so I, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. How are you, how are you capable of just functioning at all at this point? Well, I think one of the big things, and this is why I'll always recommend it to parents is I was surrounded by animals and that mm. was partly my own doing if i'm honest um so uh uh when i was really little uh uh the first it kind of started with rabbits um we lived near a cattle market there were rabbits um they were being beheaded skinned cleaned hung up by this by this giant lady with a meat cleaver there were these fluffy little things in cages right next to the store where it happened and I was just like, what? And I was like really, really young, like a toddler's age, less than four at some point. And I locked eyes with this little white one. I was like, this ain't happening to you. And we got out into the car park. And my mom was like, why is your coat wiggling? <laughs> <laughs> That's how we ended up with minty and eventually licorice and dandelion and honey. And, you know, um, they were the foundations for my empathy, my patience, and my introspect. I definitely think that animals were the root of that because you learn to care for somebody else's needs with no expectations of your own. They can't give you anything except attention. And they can't, they, just, you think about- Let me jump in for a second. So you say you learn to yeah. care for someone else without any, expect, uh, any expectation of your own needs. Mm. Or so you, sorry, that you learn to care for someone else without any expectation and kind of putting their needs above your own. I don't think right? you need to put a rabbit's needs above your own in order to care for them, but sure. definitely um, I cared about them before I learned to care about myself. But the, the thing was, you know, I was a toddler. You don't really learn a lot about self-care when you're little, but yeah. I knew it immediately. I, cause already I'd been through some stuff at that age. And I was like, I already knew what it was to be vulnerable and at the big people's mercy. And I just saw all of these little things at the big people's mercy. 
and I related to that. I connected to that in an instant. I was like, but what? I I really go ahead. Sorry, hmm? I really just wanted them to be safe. That was the first thing I ever felt about any animal. Was I just I wanted to be one of the big people that was a good thing, <laughs> you know, a good a good presence in their life. I wanted to have the power to make things better for them. What? Um, do you mind if I ask what, what happened to you at a young age where you had come to fear the big people? So much. So, so much. Um, I had a violent rel relative. I had relatives that would punish me for my tics, and, which would make them worse, which would mean that I was quite often ostracized from my family and a point of shame. I, my, fa my family broke apart quite early. But whenever I would go and be with them, they didn't understand me and they would feel embarrassed when I was at the dinner table. They'd be constantly apologizing for my behavior. They'd constantly make me stay at home alone while they went and did activities as a family because they didn't want to have to deal with the trouble I'd bring. And I was left to not, I wasn't allowed to eat with everyone. Like I'd, I'd, they'd punish me thinking it would correct my behavior and it wouldn't, it would just make it worse because the emotional side of things would make the tics worse. And so, like, whilst I was well behaved, I'd have these spats of seemingly just out of nowhere being terrible, pushing things over or making loud noises or swearing. Um, and they just didn't understand it and thought that I would just act out out of nowhere. So, yeah, I, I just had um, I didn't have much that was fun. Most of the time I was just scared of what they would do next because I couldn't predict when I'd upset them. Hmm. You actually kind of answered, I was about to ask, like, you know, you're, you're talking a lot about other people's feelings and, and how they reacted. I was really curious about how you felt in those situations. Like, what did you understand about why you did these things? Like, I and, didn't and... understand any of it. I just, I knew that I wanted to get on with everyone. I knew that I wanted to engage and have fun. I knew that I wanted to be accepted. I just didn't know how because I couldn't stop the thing that they were asking me to stop. And I didn't know why I couldn't stop. It was, it felt like it would happen. And then I'd realize after what happened. How did and then you like, feel... my heart would sink. <laughs> how, did, how would you feel about yourself? Um, out of place. And always having to excuse or apologize for my presence there. Like everyone else was getting on with things, but not me. I was trying to be a part of it, but always having to excuse my presence and always an inconvenience. Just felt like I was constantly having to apologize for existing. Hmm. I mean, it's, it's interesting because I, I even wonder about some of the things that you said earlier about burnout and sort of how you tend to ignore your needs. Hmm. And, and it's, I'm almost wondering if you know, when you feel hunger or thirst, whether there's some part of your mind that sort of views that as an inconvenience and, mm. and kind of views yourself as sort of an inconvenience that needs to be attended to. Mm. I'd never thought about it. That way. Right. Cause like, here's, here's what I hear, Anita. I hear someone who's very caring, but caring to the point of neglecting themselves. Right? I think it, that's common among people who are carers, though. If, you, if the first level of engagement you ever know is a one-sided relationship, you end up em emulating that later in life. Often our parents are the templates we use to engage with others, and my relationship with one of mine was definitely all giving, and without any kind of reciprocating for long periods of time. Yeah. So that's interesting. So first of all, really, by the way, this is awesome. I don't know if you're just brilliant or you've been through a bunch of therapy or you're well-read or whatever, but it's, it's really <laughs> fantastic to talk to someone who is um, so introspective and, and able to really look at themselves. So let's, let's, let's think about that for a second, right? So you're saying that our parents are a template, the template mm -hmm. that we follow, but what, what did your parents model for you? Well, my mom was sick, so I I learned a lot just because I had to learn how to cook when I was really really young, like under the age of ten. Sure, I had to learn to deal with bailiffs and landlords and bills, and I had to deal with 
calling in about repairs and you know my safety as well I had to I was very cognizant of my safety because no one was going to keep me safe except me so I learned to be very responsible very young and I'm, I'm grateful for that and when my mom was well she was a really great example she was a scientist she was really great at dancing she was an accomplished artist um she was a photographer she you know she got so many qualifications and she was just brilliant in many ways and that was very inspiring to me so she wasn't all bad um but i think i definitely learn to be most comfortable when i'm giving but not very 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 comfortable or secure when i'm receiving anything well yeah i mean so you you say that and and that makes that we can clearly see the thing that i'm kind of confused about is that doesn't seem like the template that your mom gave you Right, the template that your mom gave you was to be the receiver of care, not the giver of care. Mm. You actually became the opposite of your mom. True. Yeah, I could see that. Right, so that's weird. Like, because I agree with you, generally speaking, children become some version of their parents because that's what's modeled to us. So we just, you know, we learn through observation, monkey see, monkey do. And but um, that's not what I meant. I meant as in like, uh, quite often I feel that we, our parents give us the template with our engagement. So if you have a parent who is quite aggressive towards you, then um, your, you, your template is when you grow up is that you conflate love with aggression and pe you allow people to be aggressive towards you because your parents always told you, I love you yet hit you. And so you can accept that kind of dichotomy dichotomy i don't yep. know what the right word is um when you're older because it's very familiar i don't know that i copy my parents but i certainly copy uh or relive some of the ways that i engage with them with other people I, uh -huh. I think that's what i mean by that template yeah so beautifully put right so that's actually exactly what we see we don't see you copying your parents behavior we see you your behaviors as responses the way that you learn to relate to other people is based on the model of the way that you related to your mom, which is one-sided caring. Yeah. What do you think about that? It's hard to break out of because it's a very expected role of women. So like for pe other people are very comfortable receiving from me. Pe other people are very comfortable with me making food for them or giving them tea or bringing them gifts or attending to their needs or listening to their feelings. Um, I think that it's very, very difficult to step out of that role when people are very comfortable with you being that. And things like having good self-esteem and being proud of yourself or being open about your sexuality and things like that are quite often frowned upon. And, you know, given women who do that are giving pretty nasty labels quite often. So I think growing up, people very much accepted the way that I'd been shaped and I was never really incentivized to change it. Can I think for a second? Mm -hmm. So let's take your so beautiful example earlier, by the way, about sort of people who grow up with, um, let's say, aggressive or angry parents and who conflate love and anger because it feels normal to them. And then oftentimes children who are abused will wind up in relationships as adults with people who are abusive. And I, th I think you, you offered a wonderful and insightful explanation of how, you know, it feels normal to them that like you can, you can be the victim of aggression and also the recipient of love from the same person. It fits. And then this person ends up in an abusive relationship after abusive relationship after abusive relationship. And then one day they, they come and they say exactly what you just said. People are comfortable with receiving what I have to give. They're comfortable with me making them soup and, and listening to their feelings. And I could imagine the same person or not, like the, the person in our hypothetical scenario saying, yeah, I'm, I date a bunch of dudes or women who are very comfortable beating the shit out of me and then telling me that they love me the next day. People are just like that. What would you say to them? I think it's very easy to, I think it's very easy for violence to become invisible if it's all you've ever known in the same way that if you have a teapot in the room 
um, and it might be the most ugly teapot in the world and everyone who comes in might see it and it might be the first thing they notice in the house because they're not used to the teapot. But if you grew up with that teapot in that room, you might not even see it anymore. You might walk past it every single day and it won't be there to you sure. um, unless the one take calls attention to it. And so with violence, it might seem very garishly opposite, uh, like very garishly um, obvious from the outside that an abusive relationship is what it is. But from the inside, if it's all you've ever known since childhood, that part becomes invisible, especially if you're very desperate for love and attention. And that was also something you didn't get very much of as a child. Are and you often desperate abusive... for love and attention? I don't know. I feel uncomfortable with love and attention. T definitely Twitch was an adjustment in that respect. I feel worried when that happens more than anything. I think Yeah, so Anita, let me ask you a question. Why does the uh, I agree with you that everything about that you said about the teapot is is once again very eloquently put. Um mm -hmm. it, but let me ask you like when that person says, "Yeah, I end up dating abusive person after abusive person after abusive person." That's just the way let's say men are or women mm -hmm. are uh, because mm -hmm. men get abused too. Mm -hmm. How would you respond to that person? Like, sure, you're saying that it feels normal to you, but like, why do you think they keep on winding up in abusive relationships? Is it because everyone is fundamentally abusive? I think that people who tend to, I wouldn't know how to put this to someone in that situation, because I think hearing it in and of itself doesn't destroy that worldview. But I think that um, People who are passive in the face of violence attract violent people because violent people don't hang around people who won't put up with their shit. So the only people they're going to connect with are people who are passive and will continue to engage with them even when their boundaries are not respected. And those people are harder to find, but they will always find the people who will allow them to do it. So in, in a certain way, um, these people who are subject to abuse and people who are abusers tend to attract each other. But they're kind of separate from the rest of the world in that a lot of other people can engage with each other without hurting each other or being harmed. It's just that this particular um, life trap tends to magnetize towards the opposite. And right. that can definitely lead to a cycle. So, Anita, who are you magnetized towards? And who is magnetized towards you? I don't know. When I, before I started streaming, there were a lot of dark people in my life because even now, and my friends will say it, I'm very patient. My first reaction when someone messes up the first time is, we all make mistakes. I'll make, I'll make a mistake someday. And I hope I'm forgiven for it. We're all human. And I try to like help them through it and go, here's how we don't do this next time. Don't worry, buddy. And I try to maintain the connection and repair it, even if I'm not the person who's broken it. So my friends will probably tell you that I put up with a lot more than I should. <laughs> um, and that I probably do attract quite a lot of dark people. But since I started streaming, Twitch is full of givers, people who want to give you their time and attention with no expectation. And I'm not used to that. And that was scary when I first arrived. Um, and now I'm surrounded by people who are definitely very much the opposite of that. I, I'm very lucky to have fallen into that place because it's given me a whole new scope of life and friends that are really amazing and safe. Sounds wonderful. And it sounds like it was really a growth a point of growth for you to kind of um, essentially feel very uncomfortable with other people's giving because that didn't feel right to you. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I found a way to overcome that, though. How'd you do that? Well, I thought about the... It was actually something a therapist said ages ago. She was like, but it didn't really click until I fell here. And it was, how do you feel when you're giving? And I went, good, it's a way to connect with people. It's a way to indulge the best part of myself. I feel good about these interactions. I feel good when I see people happy. And she was like, well, why, what do you think other people are feeling when they're giving to you? And I was like, I guess exactly that. So how do you think they feel if you refuse and you pull away? And I was like, ah, okay, now I get it. <laughs> yeah, and absolutely. And so I, I contextualize it, yeah. Can I share a story that reminded me of something from my own life that I kind of learned that my wife taught me. Can I share that? Hell so, yeah. so my mom and grandmother, so I'm, I, my, I have one brother. So growing up and coming from an Indian culture, like, um, gender norms are very regimented. So like men do certain things and don't do other things. Um, and growing up, you know, my brother and I were actually pretty chill 
And so, you know, my mom and grandmother would sometimes come visit us and then they'd ask us like, what do we want to eat for dinner? And we viewing ourselves as chill, we would kind of, or, you know, actually being chill, depending on it, we'd say like, you know, you can make whatever you want to, or like, we can eat whatever you want. Like, I don't, I don't really care. Like whatever you want to do is fine. And then what do you think that did to them when we would say whatever? Any idea? I have no idea. Were okay. they were they surprised? Were they uncomfortable with that? Yeah, sort of. So like like then what happened? They would ask us like, "Do you want to eat this or do you want to eat this?" Because my mom and grandmother would really derive, especially my grandmother, because she basically, I mean, she spent a lot of her life in in the kitchen, and so she derived mm-hmm. a lot of enjoyment and pleasure out of like demonstrating her love through food, and that was kind of what she did. And, and so we would say whatever. And then she would ask us like, okay, do you want to eat this? And we'd be like, yeah, that's fine. And then she's like, do you want to eat this? And we'd be like, yeah, that's fine too. Do you want to eat this? And she'd we'd be like, yeah, that, that's fine. And, and then my wife one day pointed out to me that you're driving him absolutely fucking crazy. Like if you, like what you should do is just tell them you want to eat something because they want, they want you to say something and then they want to do eat, feed you whatever you want to eat. And they want to watch you enjoy it. But unless you actually express a preference, you're actually doing them a disservice because they're here to care for you. So like, let them care for you and just tell them what you want to eat or just pick something. If you don't actually care, just pick any, anything and then pretend you really want to eat it and then let them make it. And whether you like it or don't like it, just say it's awesome and express your gratitude and eat and stuff yourself. And it kind of made me realize that like, sometimes the best thing that we can do for people is for us to like, for us to help them is not to actually be neutral towards them, but for us to actually be helped by them, mm. right? Is for us to actually like let them Show help them us. Dick. Yeah. Sorry. That wasn't what yeah. I, I meant, but you know, I get that. that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Breakfast. I, I, I can agree that, you know, being able to state your needs is an opportunity for others to indulge the best in themselves and to rise up to that. And sometimes it can feel awkward and uncomfortable for many reasons some people have low self-worth and feel uncomfortable others don't like attention and feel uncomfortable um some people feel demanding and feel like it's too much to ask there are so many reasons why many people i bet in chat feel a bit weird asking for anything um i know i'm not the only person and i still have to fight it on an emotional level even though i feel like i i understand it on a on what is the emotional level what do you mean by that well i think sometimes instinctively the way that we've grown up the way that we felt for most of our lives lingers even if we reason our way out of it we still have to contend with the emotional side of things even if we understand how the trick is done the magic trick can still affect you it's, sure. it's, well, that's, a, that's a bad so, analogy because you yeah what is the emotion what is it the emo- what is the emotion that you're contending with hmm I think it's a mixture of fear and shame. Yeah, definitely. Okay. I Help definitely have to fear, bury that. Hmm. What are you afraid of and what are you ashamed of? I don't know. I, I, I guess another way to explain it would be like, when someone's nice to me it's always felt like i've taken out a loan of like two billion pounds or something i'll never be able to pay it back i'm not in a position like because when i was younger if people were nice to me i was like there's nothing i can do i can't make this good i'm just taking and everyone around me was always saying all you do is take 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 you 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 know you're you're you never give back and it's like i don't know how you haven't shown me how um and i didn't i didn't really know what to do about it i just felt indebted and it and it felt really concerning and worrying. But also people used to be nice to me in order to then later be cruel. It was manipulative. There were adults around me that weren't, didn't have the best intentions growing up. And I didn't have as much protection because my parents weren't there. So in that sense, it became intimidating. It was almost a threat to receive things. And I might be blamed or I'm, people might get angry at me later for having them. So I guess I was just concerned in general. Like the, all of that would just hit me in a wave. And sometimes it still does and I have to catch it and go, nope, everything's good now. And, you know, I can bake the neighbor a cake next time, you know, and everything's okay. So it sounds like you were afraid of the other shoe dropping. 
that people were nice to you and then there would be pain afterward? Hmm. Yeah. So that's fear. What is shame? I, I heard mm-hmm. a wonderful exploration of fear, but I didn't understand too much about why you felt ashamed. I don't know. I guess... Um... I think it was instilled from a young age that I wasn't supposed to take anything. Once I asked for a chocolate and um, one of my, my member of my family went, no, you can't ask for things. That's rude. And really, really shamed me in front of everyone, like really loudly, everything went quiet. And they kind of exploded at me for asking if I could have a chocolate too. And there was a situation where um, I went to a friend's house and I made them toast. They asked me to go down and make the toast for them. And I went down and made toast and their grandparents caught me. I'm like, all you do is take, 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 like, oh, that's all you ever do. And I was like, I haven't taken anything from you. This isn't you for me. But like, I immediately feel shamed because I feel like if I receive anything, it's, I'm not supposed to have this. This isn't meant for me. Like the, there's this idea ever since I was younger that I'm not supposed to take it. I'm not supposed to have anything that, you know, that it, it I don't even know how to explain it. But yeah, so I feel guilty whenever I do. <laughs> okay. Can I think for a second? Hmm. He wants breakfast. Send it now. Press F for breakfast. I like that voice. It sounds like a, like a, like a Siri or something. It sounds like a, I don't, I don't know how to describe it. It sounds like a voice that you hear on like a phone or. Yeah. Thank you. It's, it's a voice. I often um, have ticks in for some reason or another. Um, I, my ticks take to have a totally different vocal range than I do generally. For some reason, some of them are high pitched. Some of them have a lisp. Some of them sound like a sat nav, you know. I yeah, yeah, sat nav. That That's what it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it also, uh, uh, Anita, it's it's cool to talk to someone, and you sort of mentioned that sometimes emotions make your tics more active, and mm. and it's been fun to watch. Um, and I hope this doesn't come across as, as mean. It's just I find it very. So a lot of times when I talk to people, I struggle to know what they're feeling or how they could be feeling. And it's been neat to sort of have a little bit of a barometer for what you could be feeling based on how active your tics are. And that there there are certain times where, you know, it's clear that you're focused and paying attention and you're speaking and sharing, and then your tics kind of go down. And if there's a period of silence and then your mind is left some energy, some leftover energy, it sort of manifests outward as a a tic. And and that's been neat to kind of think a little bit about. I've never been able to quite get a thermometer or barometer of someone's like mental energy, emotion, and focus in the way that I have in talking with you. So I'm, I'm learning a lot. It's actually kind of cool. That's cool. Yeah. I get a lot of, um, abuse for it in chat because, uh, people go, ah, she forgot to tick. See, I knew it was fake. Every time she talks or focuses, she forgets, um, how she drops her act. And I'm just like, no, that's not how it works. Please don't pressure me like that. No, 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 it's really not how it works. I mean, the the way that I would envision ticks for you is an excess of mental energy. So if your mental energy is spent Mm -hmm. in a particular way, and if we think about what does emotion do to your mind, it creates energy in your mind, right? So like emotion leads to increased activity. So the more increased activity that you have that you cannot focus. So if we think about energy of the mind is having inflows and outflows, when it rises above a certain level, I think a tick manifests. And so the more inflow you have through emotion and stress, the greater your chances of ticks are. The more outflow that you have through, let's say, focus, practice, flow, music, engaged in conversation, that decreases the energy and decreases the manifestation of ticks. I think it's really just about energy in the mind. That's such a good way of explaining it. Thank you. I might steal that next time someone asks me on my stream. (laughs) Steal away. Thank and you. it's been really fun to see because even when I, when I start talking more, I think your tics manifest more because it doesn't require all of your attention to listen. Um, mm. So I have a couple of questions for you. 
if that's mm. okay. Yeah, totally. So the first is, and and so let me actually start off by saying this. So, you know, it's clear to me, I, I think either you've done a lot of really, or probably both, but you've done a lot of wonderful introspective work where you really studied yourself and figured out how the fuck you work, which is awesome. And it sounds to me like you've had a couple of really good therapists. Um, you said you had four, and I'd guess that at least a couple of them were like really good and helped you a lot. What do you think? I'd say one was a life changer. Yeah. The rest were kind of meh. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, since meeting her, she changed my life. So I've been raising funds and giving them to her to pay for other people to see her because I really believe in what she does. So the stream has helped me to get other people to get help through her, which has been amazing. That's um, awesome. But yeah. I also read, but I think the agoraphobia allowed me to really stop and think and process who I am, what I want to be, my ethics, my understanding of the world, and not fitting in allowed me to observe on, from an outsider's role because I couldn't quite click. And so these things have kind of come together as me um, just trying to make sense of the world as much as I possibly can. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and I think you've really come a long way. Which kind of makes, I mean, I view that I have a duty to people who come on stream, which is to help them understand something or grow in some way. I feel like that's what people come on here for. Um, not to say that that's why you came on, but that's what I personally feel. Uh, so mm -hmm. I believe that it is part of my karma, my karma, that I've been given certain advantages and unique opportunities to learn. And that it's part of my job to pass those on to people who may benefit from them. And I never know who that person is. Um, and so I'm going to ask you a couple of questions if, if that's okay, or frame a couple mm -hmm. of things. And then my hope is that, um, you know, when we think about burnout, that there's still a, some part of you that doesn't let you take care of yourself in the way that you deserve to be taken care of. And mm -hmm. if we think about this, like, you know, there was, a uh, uh, Anita 1.0 which was sort of uh -huh. like the caregiver and wouldn't receive anything. And then there was Anita 2.0, which is able of giving and receiving. And then mm -hmm. I'm kind of seeing Anita 3.0, who is someone who is, um, is able to actually give to herself. Right. And, and so I think you mm -hmm. can now receive from other people, but I don't know. And I'm sure you can to a certain degree receive from yourself because I think, I mean, there's no way that you can become the person that you have without having compassion towards yourself. And at the same time, I see a little bit of a pattern left over where you have difficulty like giving yourself things from yourself. What mm -hmm. do you think about that? Yeah, I think if I took you on a house tour, you'd see that a lot. <laughs> how do you, um, how do you mean? What, what does a house tour have to do with that? I don't buy things for myself. I, um, all of the people that visit my house say my walls are bare. I have barely any furniture. I have very few things. Most of the things in my house are rabbit related and for them or, you know, it's like, yeah, there's not really much that I do or invest time in that's for me at all yep. in this house. So, so, I mean, in a broad sense, and this may be a little bit unfair, but I just don't know how else to describe it. Like, I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of why can't you love yourself? Hmm. And that's, right. it's a good question. So, and I've got a little bit of a hypothesis. So what do you think about your mom? I think she's amazing. I think she's a very strong person. I think mm -hmm. um, she, she gets very fixated on a task and she, she's changed laws and she's changed the world in beautiful ways. And, you know, I think, yeah, I, I definitely see a lot of good in her and I hope I can match up to it someday. Yeah. So I'm wondering, that all sounds really positive. I'm wondering if you have any negative feelings towards your mom. No. I mean, the rest of my family has a lot of criticisms because they think that maybe she let me down. But from a first person, like from an in the family perspective, um, I'm not going to hate on her for being sick. Not at all. Um, and I'm really impressed with how much she did manage during that time, you know? Yeah. Did she let you down? No, I think she really tried. And I think that's really very, very evident in that when she did have periods where she had more energy, you know, she would always, you know, go and get treats for me and things like that. And, you know, she'd show her affection in some ways. Not all. I've never hugged my mum. I've, she doesn't show affection in conventional ways. So we have a strange relationship. 
but I definitely do appreciate the times where you know she would she would do the most she could with what you know what little energy she had so, yeah so let's think about that so Anita I'm going to challenge you a little bit there and I, I know this is going to sound I'm not trying to I, it sounds like your mom really is a wonderful person and that she really is inspirational but I think that there's something very very subtle because you've come like 90% of the way and it's clear to me like you've done immense stuff and I think oftentimes that last 10% is is very counterintuitive so mm-hmm. let me let me just toss out some of the language that you're saying, right? So she tried. Mm-hmm. She did the best that she could. I'm not gonna mm-hmm. I'm not gonna blame someone who's ill. Mm-hmm. All positive things, right? Makes sense. It's fair. Mm-hmm. But let me ask you something. Is there a difference between doing a good job and doing the best that you can? Yeah, definitely. So we, when we think about your mom, when you say she did the best that he can, the funny thing is that that's, uh, she did the best that she could. The funny thing is that statement has an underside to it, which is sort of an acknowledgement that she didn't do a great job, right? It's not mm-hmm. that you blame her for not doing a great job. Mm-hmm. There's a difference between blaming someone for not doing a great job and like admitting that someone didn't do a great job. Hmm. What do you think about but is that? that? Is that fair? I mean, my mom had a disability. I wouldn't blame her for being in bed a lot in the same way that I wouldn't blame someone in a wheelchair for not walking. Like, this this isn't a parental failing. This is illness, you know? Yeah, and, so and- this is this is where things get really weird, Anita. Because when we look at your upbringing, so there's a difference between blaming someone for something and acknowledging that they actually like that there were problems, right? Because if mm-hmm. we look at uh, if we look at it from the outside, and I know this is, sounds really weird. I'm really not trying to beat up on your mom. It's just it's I've hard. worked with people who have been. So let me. Can I tell you a story? So I was working with a, a, a patient who um, you know came in and and also had huge respect for his dad. Mm-hmm. And his, when he was young, his mom, when he was about nine, his mom got, no, when he was seven, his mom got diagnosed with cancer and then passed away when he was nine. And his, it was hard on everyone in the family. It was hard on him. It was hard on his younger sister. It was hard on his dad. And, you know, his dad was really in grief. And and what would happen is he would finish working around five or 6 p.m., he would go to a bar every day after work and then he'd have a few beers and he'd come home around eight or nine. And his, his you know, 10-year-old son and his seven-year-old daughter would be with a babysitter. Like they'd come home from school, babysitter would pick him up and the babysitter would be them from like, with them from like three to eight, okay? So, and he recognizes, so his dad worked really hard, tried to give him lots of opportunities, did a lot of good stuff, like, you know, tried to, teach him things and and was a good dad in a lot of ways. And, mm-hmm. and then when I kind of asked him, I was like, you know, how did you feel when, when your dad would like go drinking every day? He was like, well, my dad was like, you know, he'd lost my mom too. And he loved her a lot. And I don't blame him for going to the bar because he was in a period of grief. And, mm-hmm. and then he kept on saying the same thing, which is like, he did the best that he could, right? Like mm-hmm. he doesn't blame him for doing that thing. But the the weird thing is if you really stop and think about it, just because his dad, even if we accept for a moment that his dad did the best that he could, it doesn't mean that he did a great job, right? Like it doesn't mean that he didn't let his son down in some ways. We're not blaming him for letting his son, letting his son down, right? We're saying that he's got a good reason. He's a human being. He's hurt. He has grief. And so we're not going to blame him for that. But at the same time, we should be honest with the fact that like his dad whether he has a good reason or bad reason, wasn't able to provide for his son what his son deserved. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so when I think about your upbringing, I think about an upbringing that really was not good in a lot of ways. What do you think? Yeah, I I would say that there were definitely times where I wasn't safe. There were things that happened to me. There were times where I needed to learn how to process things and I never got um, any kind of, uh, I don't know, emotional tool set sure. to kind of handle the things around me. I was definitely feeling out the world alone in many circumstances and I get that. And that's 
that's something that I don't look at as something like, it's really hard to say the, the sentence, I deserved anything. I don't feel deserving of anything. I have no expectations of life. Life is chaos. You, you aren't defined by your challenges. You're defined by how you handle them. And I, I, my parents, they were young. My dad was uh, like young, in, in these young teens. I'm not sure when. And my, my mom was in her young, well, in her teens. I'm not exactly sure how old they were, but they were in their teens anyway. And they, they didn't um, really know how to be parents when I was born. So kind of, they were thrown in at the deep end and I didn't expect them. I wouldn't expect any teenager, any kid essentially to know how to be a perfect parent. So I just feel lucky that I managed rather than angry that I didn't get anything. And so, I don't really know how to see it any other way. Yeah. And that's why I think you can't love yourself. So I, I know this is going to sound really bizarre, but just run. So like, first of all, let's, let's start by there's a 90% chance I'm wrong and 10% chance I'm right. Can we start with those odds? <laughs> but I've got this really bass backwards way of looking at this. So in a, in a weird way, I, I think that you grew up with givers and takers, right? And your mom was a taker and you were a giver, right? Mm -hmm. And you decided then and there that it was good to be a giver and bad to be a taker. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can pretty much agree with that. So if we stop and we think about that, if you say that being a giver is good and being a taker is bad, what does that say about your mom? Yeah, good point. What does it say? That logic would say that she was bad. Right? So, and, and I think this is the problem with givers, is that givers sometimes don't acknowledge that like they shouldn't be giving that the person who's taking from them is doing like a bad thing right like mm -hmm. that's like when we think about the abusive relationship and stuff like that because you're comfortable in giving mm -hmm. and there's some people who are comfortable in taking Blah. and it can be hard because i'm not saying that you shouldn't love and respect your mom and i'm not saying that you should blame her but at the same time i think you should acknowledge that there is like a giver and a taker in this relationship and that I yeah. find it uh, as much as that you cover everything with like positivity, which I think is resilient and good. I think you have to acknowledge, or I, I think that the way to really love yourself, and I'll, I'll t talk about how, is to first of all, acknowledge that like your mom could have done a better job, right? So even if she was ill or whatever, or maybe she couldn't have done a better job. You can forgive. So here's the, uh, here's what it is. I don't know that you've forgiven your mom for raising you the way that she did because you don't blame her, right? And so in a weird way, like you can't forgive someone for something that you don't blame them for. Like mm -hmm. if you smack me across the face and I think that, oh, that wasn't your fault, then there's like no forgiveness from my end because it wasn't your fault. Mm -hmm. Like what point is there in forgiving something if no one is at fault? Mm -hmm. And when I think about what, what are you not able to do for yourself? <laughs> what are you not able what? to you're not able to love yourself. And I think part of that is like what we mean by love is when you indulge, you're not able to cut yourself some slack. You're not able to forgive yourself for buying a painting for your wall because it feels indulgent for you. Because in that mm -hmm. moment, you're a taker and you're not a giver anymore. In that moment, I think you become a little bit more like your mom, which is not someone that you want to be. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Thoughts? I can see that. I don't know. That's a lot to process. Okay. And I do I do notice that sometimes when I try to process things that are uncomfortable, my brain just bounces off them. Yep. So it's very it's it's a very it's a very difficult thing to penetrate. Good. I mean I I th I think it's very good that you're noticing that. I could be wrong. But my point here is that, you know, when, when you were talking about dichotomies earlier, right, that someone can be aggressive mm -hmm. towards you and love you, I think that there's a dichotomy here, which mm -hmm. is that you can love and respect your mom and not blame her for her disability, which I don't think you should do. And you can also acknowledge that just because it's not her fault doesn't mean that you didn't get a bad break. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I think that there's a part of you that like, cause if we think about it, it's bizarre. It's like, like you don't want to be a taker. Like that's the problem is that you're not willing to be a taker. You want to be a giver. 
And mm-hmm. you've learned through a lot of introspection and growth and, and frankly, discomfort, how to take things from people or receive things from people, gifts and support on Twitch. But even then, like, it's like, you won't even, you'll take their, resp- their, their gifts and you'll pass them on, right? Like you're like, I, it's like hot potato. Like they can give you positivity and you're just going to hot potato it right out to your therapist so that she can help other people. Like, Heaven forbid that I take anything. Like, don't give anything to me. Like, let me just, let me do, let me be a good person and go help other people. And that sounds wonderful, but there's actually something really fucked up there, which is like, why can't you just accept people's gifts? Like, why can't the potato land with you? Why can't people just do something for you? And why can't you take it? Why can't you be on the receiving end of other people's like care and affection and positivity? Like what within you rebels so much against that? Because that's why you beat the shit out. Like you not beat the shit, but like, that's why you neglect yourself so hard. Like, why do you live in a room? I'm not, I think it's fine to live in a Spartan room. Like I lived in a Spartan room for years of my life as well. But like, I just literally didn't care. And I don't know if it's that you don't care or that when the thought of buying something for yourself is like revolting to you. Yeah, that's the latter one. So that's fucked up, right? And then the question is like, why is it revolting to you? And I think it's because it's because smells like dick. Sorry, I think it's that's okay. I'm confused about when you're doing that. Should I stop talking and let you get it out, or should I keep going? Do whatever you're comfortable with. I don't mind. I'm just wondering whatever facilitates a discussion. I'm comfortable either way. But I I think it kind of comes back to the central idea of that, like, I think that you actually have some amount of resentment towards your mom. And I think that that resentment is valid. It doesn't make her a bad person. It doesn't make you a bad person. And I think what you need to do is, like, learn how to forgive. Because you don't forgive. You make excuses for people. You're understanding. Right? So, like, actually, like, through all of your positivity, like, this is the really, really subtle thing is you come across as, and you are, a really, like, caring and loving and forgiving person. But you don't really forgive. What you do is you allow people to behave badly. And you're so understanding that you let them get away with it. Because, like, just like you said, when someone, when, when you said that friends noticed that, like, you cut people slack, like, we think about that as a positive thing. And I think this is a prime example of, it absolutely is a positive thing. And 90% of the way, it's positive. But that last 10%, is when it starts to become a little bit toxic. That last 10% is when you should blame people for being mean to you. You can forgive them, but you should absolutely blame them if they're letting you down. Yeah. And so I think this issue of blame and forgiveness is what you need to learn, which is like actually holding people accountable if they let you down. And and there's this weird kind of like, I mean, sure, your mom was sick and I don't know what kind of illness she has and it's not my place to be judgmental, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. Like, I I mean, just, just the raw amount of Lord, have you read Lord of the Flies? Know what Lord of the Flies is? I haven't read it yet. I still need to. (laughs) So it's a story about like a group of kids who wind up on an island and they like sort of like become primitive and and brutal. It's Mm -hmm. like when I hear about your upbringing, it sounds like Lord of the fucking flies to me. It's like people are attacking you. Like adults are yelling at you. People are doing nice things to you and then being mean to you. People are being violent. People are hunting you down with rocks when you're on a paper route. Like what the fuck? Mm. And if you don't blame anyone for that, like that's not good. I know it sounds fucking weird. Like, I think instead of giving people excuses, what I would really think, encourage you to do is think a little bit about blaming them if you really do feel that way. Dig down and see if you feel something like that. Mm-hmm. And then forgive them. And then in, in learning how to forgive, if you can forgive your mom, I think you'll be able to love yourself. Yeah. That's what I got. Well, that's something to work on. That's some homework. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if it doesn't sit with you, that's okay, too. I mean, I'm oftentimes wrong because I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. So. Sounds like you do to me. But yeah. Am I allowed to ask some questions? Absolutely. Uh, what decided, What made you decide to move what you do onto Twitch? Um, just the realization that. I could work in my office for 10 hours a day, six days a week for the rest of my life. And I would never make a dent in anyone's life, like in the problem. 
for what I view as the problem. Yeah. That that coupled with the the realization that most of what I do in my office is repeated. Right. So case in point, like when I'm talking to you, the reason I have this hypothesis is because I've run through this with another person who is also wonderful and positive and resilient and just a great guy that everyone loves. And he's just so positive and like, like he's also a caregiver. Wow. He's like a giver. He like supports his yeah. family. He supports his in-laws. He supports everyone. And, and that yeah. like, in, in the, there's a very, like when we become good people, we start to not want to admit that we have like dark sides, right? Like, mm -hmm. like you're, but that's just not how human beings are. We're, I mean, we have love and compassion and we also have hatred and shame and fear. And you sound like you've done a great job. You can cap, you can find your fear and you can find your shame so easily, which you really deserve mm -hmm. credit for because it's hard to do that. What I don't hear from you at all is an ounce of anger or hatred. And I just I don't think- I, I kind of save it up for things that I think are okay to be mad at. The thing is, I see anger as like a hopeful emo emotion. Like it's when you don't stand for how things are. So you have this motivation to change them and challenge them. And so I don't let myself be angry at trivial shit, like drama on, on bloody Facebook. But so I do let myself be angry at injustices and let that be a motivation to change things for the better yeah, but, as well. But, but you see that, like, you see how, like, I mean, it sounds so wonderful, right? But you see how fucking judgmental that is? You see how, like, you don't let yourself feel a way about a petty thing because you don't, like, you're not letting yourself be you. You're judging yourself for being, like, I think it makes sense that you should be angry with injustices and fuel that anger and, like, make the world a better place and, like, let's protect rabbits. Absolutely. But at the same time, you're also not letting yourself be a taker in that moment. True, but I, I kind of feel like there are certain things that define you, and I don't want to be defined by how I feel about trivial things. When I catch myself reading something that genuinely doesn't matter, or getting annoyed at something that genuinely doesn't matter, I'm, I'm like, am I going to waste hate on this? I can just move on. Like this, this so hate hurts me. So why just? just let it go is it hurting anyone then i don't care and so i'd rather direct my attention to constructive things absolutely so so i think that that makes sense and i think there's a middle ground because i think you say i'd rather i'd rather spend my energy on constructive things which makes sense which is exactly why you don't have art on walls right because you don't allow yourself the indulgence of doing things that are unconstructive and that i actually yeah. think is not fair to you i don't think you deserve to only be doing things that are constructive. I, I think you deserve a break from time to time. I think you deserve to be indulgent. I think you deserve to be taken care of. I think you deserve a day off. I think you deserve to fuck up. I think you deserve mm -hmm. to put yourself first. And that not everything in like, it's so subtle because it's so fucking positive, but it's like, you deserve to be a little bit petty. Like you're allowed to be a little bit petty. You don't have to be a saint. And I'm, I'm with you that I don't think you should, you know, spend time getting wrapped up in, with drama on Facebook. Like, I think that's just a waste of everyone's time. But what I'm saying yeah. is that you're actually at one end of the extreme. And I think your way forward, because if we think about, like, you don't value yourself, right? Like, you know, you're a good person and you value yourself in a very, like, big way, but you don't value yourself in, like, a little way. Mm. I you, think like, there I, are two things that are really relevant to that discussion. And one of them is that you don't get to fuck up on Twitch. Like, you don't get to misspeak. You don't get to have a past. You don't get to, you know, mess up in your relationships and things like that. Because those things, you'll be punished for. Those things, depending on your size, there are people who've taken, like, two million pound pay cuts because they fucked up in a private moment with their partner. Something no one would ever have. Millions of people angry at them for. No one judging them for. No one, you know, giving them hate mail, sending death threats for not affecting their job in any way, losing sponsors for, like, this is a, uh, 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 this is a place where there is no room for fuck-ups, where there's no room for humanity. You are always perfect or you are in danger. You have, there's this place, people dehumanize you here. And that's something I think you're less at risk of the most, but something that those of us who offer mostly just ourselves, um feel every day because one day everyone hates you and the next day people love you and it turns on a dime like constant and so, the other thing is 
I agree with you with the not self-care because I used to make art. I have a drawer full of artwork right there. I don't draw. I, I've done one drawing in four years. I specialized in animation and I haven't drawn since I left uni. And it's because I feel that guilt. I don't self-indulge. And I feel like it's a, not a constructive thing to draw. It's a self-indulgent thing. So I think if, you, if, if I take your advice, I probably would do a lot more artwork. And I think you should. Because I, I don't think you have to fix the world, right? Like you, like the whole point here, Anita, is that you you undervalue yourself. In the hierarchy of what deserves attention, you are way too far down. Mm. And 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 that I really wonder if like it's because you resent your mom for taking so much from you, and you never want to be like her. Like oftentimes, like you said, we you know we like you're not you're not actually like you're so afraid. Like you kind of say. You even said when we talked about modeling and how parents model behavior, but you're like, no, 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 I'm the opposite of my mom. Absolutely. It's weird because a lot of times we're not the opposites of our parents, but you point out that you've worked very, very... So if we think about it, if we, uh, the automatic idea is that if I have an abusive parent, the chances that they have an abusive child is very high. And if they don't have an abusive child, like if their child doesn't become abusive, that is accomplished through a lot of effort on the child's parts. It's because they overcome and fight against what they were taught, right? Can I ask you a question about yeah. that? Um, do you think as, uh, with your position as a therapist that you have a lot of confirming evidence for that theory that may not be relevant to the world? Because the truth of the matter is the, parent, the children who don't end up fucked up don't come to you. I worry that we tarnish people who are, have had ab abusive parents as likely to become abusive themselves when around two thirds of them statistically don't. Yes. And I think that, yeah. And that a lot of therapists think that a lot of people become abusive because they've been abused, but most people can triumph over that. It's it. And we, we, I hope that people who've been through a lot of shit don't get stereotyped because of it, because the people who come to treat those who fell through the net, didn't get the support they needed and ended up abusing because they don't know how to connect. Those people need help, um, but they can also paint a, a picture to therapists and the people who help them. That this is inevitably who you become if you have abusive parents. And I don't know that's true. And I want to be one of the people that proves that that isn't true. I want to be one of the people that says, you know, we don't always turn out that way. And many of us can get over it. No, so I agree with you 100%. So I, I'm glad you brought that up. So, I, so, I, so the statistics just say that people who are abused are more likely to be abusive. And you're right that it's about a 30% chance, right? So the statistics are low. The second thing is that I completely agree with you that your future is not determined by the way that you were raised. In fact, what I've seen time and time and time again in my job is that you can overcome those things. And I think what we see from you is that you have overcome those things. My point is that that overcoming is, I do think that the people who were abused growing up have a harder game to play. They're playing the game on hard mode. This is the way that I'd put it. That people who have loving parents are playing the game on easy mode. People who have something between loving and abusive are playing the game on normal. And then people who have abusive parents are playing the game on hard mode. Now, all three of those people can beat the level at the end of the day. It's just the deck is stacked against them. And sometimes yeah. the people who end up becoming abusive, once again, I don't blame them because I think that they were playing a tougher game. Yeah. So, and I'm with you that they can overcome things. If I didn't think that they could overcome things, I couldn't do my job. Like my whole point is that you can overcome that. Yeah. The second thing that I want to address is, is there a confirmation bias because I'm a therapist? Very possibly. It's something that I struggle with a lot, but I really don't think so. Because I think that you're assuming that the people that I see are broken in some way, and I don't see them that way. I don't see the people that I see as being less than the people that I don't see. Right? So I think in a subtle, subtle way, like that in and of itself is a very, very dangerous thing. I see normal people. Everyone I yeah. see is completely normal. And that's where I start with it. This is just a normal person. And yeah. sure, can they be labeled with some kind of mental health disorder? Absolutely. But I don't think of mental health disorders as like disorders of people. I think of them as actually symptoms to deeper problems that we all face. Yeah. I've seen multimillionaires that are suicidal because they're not doing enough for their family. And I've seen people in jail who were 16 years old when they started dealing drugs because they're supposed to provide for their three older sisters because that's what a man fucking does. Yeah. Who's also suicidal because he can't see enough for his family. 
If there's one thing that my clinical practice has taught me, it's that the person in jail and the person who's the multimillionaire at the core itself, I know this sounds completely crazy, but are far more similar than they're different. Because our society has taught us that these two human beings are fundamentally different. But my work has taught me that this is why I stream on Twitch, because I don't think that the people on Twitch are rejects. I see myself in them and I see them in me. Sorry. That's okay. Anyway, so I, I, I don't think that there's a confirmation bias, but there very well could be. It's something that I struggle with, right? But I think statistically, I, I also don't see, I mean, I, a fair number of people in my practice or don't have, even don't fit criteria for a mental illness. I, I, mm-hmm. I work with people who suffer and I try to help people with suffering, which Buddha says is like a universal human condition. Yeah. But it's still possible that I have a cognitive bias, right? It's possible that there's a selection bias. It's possible that all of what I've learned is like not fair or widely applicable. But I still think when it comes back to like you, what, what I really think is that like, I, I really wonder if there's a part of you that doesn't want to become your mom. Turn left. Yeah. And you know, I'm grateful for that too, because I think every parent aspires to have a child that outdoes them Mm -hmm. and i have the benefit of learning from some of my mom's mistakes from getting you know not having to live them myself to know the pain of them and that's good too and i think it's good to some degree to want to be different from our parents want to improve on the model that they set for us i think that's a beautiful thing so i i am uncomfortable believing that yeah that i would like to be different i would like that i can see things that i wouldn't want to do or be yeah, um, I, that makes a lot of sense. Let me ask you something. Are you, I mean, I'm, I don't really know much about your personal life, but is it okay if I ask you about your thoughts about having kids or whether you have kids? I am not going to have kids. I'm not. Um, I, I think if I do start to feel broody, I will adopt because I don't think the answer to the world's problems is another dna copy of me and by the time they have kids that dna isn't passed on anymore it gets mixed and mixed again until it's completely different it's dna is not a it's a transient thing it doesn't matter but there are people out there who've been through a lot of similar things to me who are waiting for somebody to love them and they go and sit out there and loved while i create yet another human being in a very well populated earth so i think if i did have kids i would go and find someone that my tools would be particularly relevant and useful so someone that's maybe yeah. There it is. Right? So I ask you about kids and what's your answer? That I'm not going to do something. I'm going to do something. I'm like I don't it's unclear to me what your needs exactly are, but I hear the same axis of there are people out there who need my help. So who the fuck am I to create another genetic copy? What right do I have to bring <laughs> someone else into the world because there's so many kids out there who are suffering? You see how quick it is? Fuck me and what yeah. I want. And it's not even clear to me that you want kids, but I don't think you've even entertained the idea. Automatically, it's so fucking automatic. That actually upsets me because I think you're, you're actually not valuing yourself there. Mm-hmm. There's a difference between saying, I actually want kids and I'm going to give them up, but I don't think you do that. See, this is the thing. You don't even like admit to yourself that something is wrong and then give that up. You just slide right past it. And you use greater injustices to justify giving things up for yourself. It's so positive, and yet, like, there's a part of me that screams that you are doing something to you that has been done to you your entire life, which is that you're devaluing yourself. And you are saying that there are things that are more important than me. Mm. That bothers me. It bothers me really deep down. Because I don't think that that kid out there who needs a loving parent is more important than you are. Right? We all deserve to be important. Yeah. And you do it so quickly. And it's like clouded with so much positivity that it's so easy to get away with. And yet I feel hurt when I hear you say that. Which is fucking weird because you're talking about something that's so good. Mm. Can I just say to those in chat that I still think it's worth adopting, regardless of my issues aside, and that there is a a certain amount to be gained from adopting someone and connecting with someone beyond 
a genetic level, but rather passing on what's truly important about you, the thing that you decided about which is your identity, your values, and your, your, you know, your tools for navigating the world. And those things are the things you decided about yourself. Those are the things you can take credit for. Those are the things I think really matter about us. We don't choose what eye color we have, but we do choose who we are. And passing on a little bit of that in a positive way and helping someone else with that is beautiful. And I think that is still parenthood. And I still, I think it's an undervalued form of parenthood. And I'd encourage anyone in chat to adopt, regardless of my reasoning, even if it might seem a little bit dysfunctional in this context. No, I mean, but like, Anita, so thank you for sharing that. I think it's, I, I really do think your your goals are noble and I support them 100%. I think you're a wonderful person. It's just, there's something just so subtle about you putting the rest of the world first. Like, it's a weird thing, right? Mm. But that's what I hear from you time and time and time again, is that like, I put other people first. And I just don't agree with that. Mm. And in that, because I think you deserve you deserve being put first too. Mm. It's one thing to hear that, but how do you put it in practice? Because the feeling doesn't go away, and sometimes I push back the tide and I start doing things for myself, but I can never keep it up. Like yeah. I've had this issue for a long time, and <laughs> even when I did rescue work years back, I I used to go out there. I used to do anything and everything. Um, some of it was like dangerous as well, and I'd come home. And I'd be really, really exhausted. And I'd go back after an hour and do it again. Like I'd spend an hour at home a day for like a month and just completely burn out. And the thing with all of that is like, I would notice the problem, try to fix it, get started and then just fall back into it again. And I just fell back into it with streaming. Yeah. So, so Anita, great question. So I think what you, the problem here is that you're overcoming something and that's not a sustainable way to live your life. So like when, when you, when you think about like, you know, your desire to make the world a better place is to move away from something within yourself. Does that make sense? Mm. Like, I I think like a lot of your desire for goodness in the world is like, because of some badness in you, like it's just moving away. And then when you indulge something from yourself. It's like that badness within you comes up front and center, and then you don't want that feeling. So you go out and you help someone else, mm. which the world, the world loves a relationship with you <laughs> because you're, you do for the world what all these people do and they take advantage of your kindness. The world takes advantage of your kindness. The world is going to take as much as you have to give, and it'll let you chew yourself out in the process, and it won't give two shits when you burn out and when you're exhausted. The thousands of people out there who benefit from your, you know, your sacrifices will appreciate it and no one will be left to care for you. And that's completely fine. And the question is, how do you overcome that? I think you have to figure out where that sense that other people are fundamentally more important than I am comes from. And you have to explore like where you got that idea. And, and I know I keep on harping on this. This may not be right. But like, I, I, I really do wonder if you harbor some kind of resentment from your mom, for, towards your mom. And if you do harbor mm-hmm. resentment towards your mom, if you can acknowledge that, it may not be rational and it may not be fair, but you just have to like notice it, right? And, and mm-hmm. for you to hold that your mom, because you talk about your mom like an idealized figure, right? Like you mm-hmm. talk about her like she's one dimensional. Like you talk about her is is intelligent and supportive and wonderful and ill and it's tragic that she like, but parents are not one dimensional, right? All of us, like, I mean, I hope I'm a good dad, but I'm a fucking psychiatrist. So I'm sure my kids are going to be fucked up one day because that's what happens statistically, (laughs) right? And so, so, I mean, the, the truth is that there's no such thing as a perfect parent, but what I hear you describe is a perfect parent. And I think that's a problem. Yeah. And as you start to explore in what ways, like, where does that feeling come from? Like, why is it like, when I ask you this question about kids, like you launch into this whole philosophical explanation and I think, great, you guys should adopt because there are a lot of kids out there that need love. But the question is, as you, as, as I ask that question and you start explaining stuff, what is the feeling that you're moving away from? If I were to ask mm-hmm. you, Anita, I think you should have kids. Breakfast. How do you feel if I say that? Mm, defensive. Right. Right. So why do we feel defensive? It's because something hurts. We have to protect something. Mm. Time to tank up. 
So what is it that hurts with the prospect of you having kids? Like, forget about whether you actually should or shouldn't. That's your choice. If you want to adopt, by all means, go do it. But what I'm saying is like, what, what is it within you that you are feeling defensive about? Hmm. What's wrong with you having kids? I, I think, I think it's a, I think it's a, a couple of things. I think um, uh, 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 one of them is, uh, 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 is I don't really picture myself in a relationship. I don't picture myself, um, like I worry as well. Like it immediately brings up the idea of like, well, most relationships end, and then I'm eternally connected to another person who probably fucked me over at some point and you know looking at all of the awkward single parents you have to see the other parent and all this sort of stuff and I see painful connections there whereas I see a, a connection that's based on someone needing you and it's not incumbent on whether you'll sleep with them or whether they approve of you or whether they can handle your condition it's just a need and that seems purer from a you're talking about the the potential father of a child that you have or you're talking about the child mm -hmm. themselves the potential father like i think if a child needs you that's very that's a very clear and very easy thing to maintain and a very safe thing to for me it seems like that's not incumbent on anything whereas a relationship is and they fluctuate and they don't statistically last i think that a child with someone carry the idea of it carries a lot of pain compared to the idea of just helping someone who needs you. Honestly? Yeah, so that's... Thank you for sharing that. And also, like, whoa. Like, I feel like this is a whole different conversation, right? So, so yeah. in, in, because it's interesting. So I'm going to toss your words right back at you about, you know, uh, children of abusers becoming abusers. Like, why mm -hmm. do you think you have to fall victim to that statistic? Right. Where, where, I, if I you can overcome that. your upbringing, because that was a long shot, right? Like, let's be honest. Like most people who grew up in your situation where they're physically abusive, the child of teenage parents, it sounds like. Mm. And, and, you know, left to fend for themselves, like most of them end up like, you know, in like, I mean, I've worked with a lot of people with substance use and it sounds, and honestly, I'll tell you, I mean, so I, we sometimes not really joke about this, but if I can share one other thing. So, uh, Anita, I used to work in uh, an emergency room. I don't really do that kind of work anymore, but for many years I worked in an emergency room. And sometimes we'd get a kid who comes in and the kid has all these different diagnoses. They've got like bipolar disorder, marijuana use, cocaine use, depression, ADHD. And and really like with the diagnosis for the kid was, was something that there was an uh, older woman in our psychiatric ED who was brilliant. Um, she was a nurse practitioner and she would say, yeah, the kid has shit life syndrome. It's not that they have depression and bipolar and ADHD. It's just like, they've got just like a shit life. Like yeah. they don't have stability in their house. They don't have parents who are like stable. They, uh. they, it's just, you know, the child services people are involved. And the thing is, it sounds like you had shit life syndrome. Like it sounds like you grew up in a place where you didn't really have stability or care or support and you overcame the odds. And so it, it blows my mind that like you're afraid of the odds, right? Because if you've <laughs> overcome such long ass odds to become the person that you are, who's caring and compassionate and resilient, like why on earth would you think that if you chose to spend the rest of your life with someone and this gets into monogamy or whatever. So like, I don't even, let's not even presume that I'm saying this is probably mm -hmm. a different conversation, but like you have so many fears around. So your relation, your fear of having a child of your own has not, it sounds like it has nothing to do with the child it has everything to do with the partner. Yeah. And so like, I think if, I mean, so that's got to be dealt with. That has nothing to do with adoption. That's just like what, you know, like where do you get the idea that, you know, this is going to like be doomed to disaster because that also hurts me to hear. Because I, 
I think that it's possible and, and, you know, I think it's possible for people to meet each other, to be invested in each other and to build a life with each other. And yeah. the fact that you've taken that off of the table, I think makes me feel sad. Mm. I think I have some healing to do. I, I spent several years in a DV situation. Um, what is that? Domestic violence. Ah. Uh, so I had to flee someone. I had to give up my life. Uh, I was midway through studying. I got my degree. I was studying for higher education and I had to just abandon it all, move, um, leave, leave all my friends to get away from it. Um, he tried to end my life. Um, it's fucking scary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that explains and, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah. it's been hard to connect with people since. I have succeeded. I had another six-year relationship after that. Um, but I, that wasn't the best relationship either for, for other reasons. He, he never harmed me, but yeah, I kind of feel. Was he a taker? I, yes. Still getting past that one. Yeah. Um, and obviously that's how I get that window into how our relationship with our parents become so familiar that we end up reliving them mm -hmm. with our friendships and relationships. There are, I'm very aware of that. And um, still figuring my way through it. I'm still figuring out how to draw people of a different kind and to be in a safer, more stable place. Because um, sadly, and here's the thing, people get cross with women who keep ending up in abusive relationships. There are so many jealous men who are like, she only gets with dickheads, um, women like bad boys, and all those generalizations. But the truth is, I didn't end up with bad people because I love bad boys. I was hopeful and naive every time, and every bad person will tell you they're good at the start. And if you're hopeful, Wise you'll believe words. them. Yeah. And so I, I end up convincing myself never again. I'm going to go for someone nice, someone kind. And the most so can I tell you to go for something else? Yeah. I don't want you to go for someone who's nice. I want you to go for yourself. What do you mean? So like the undercurrent for everything that I'm hearing from you, Anita, is that you put other people first. I want you to be in a relationship where you come first. I don't even know what that looks like. Absolutely. And that's the fucking problem. That is the fucking problem. Is that you have no idea what it's like to put yourself first. You have no idea what it's like to be in a relationship where you get put first. And that I think someone in your fucking upbringing deserves some blame for. <laughs> and so I think it starts with baby steps. Yeah. Get yourself some artwork. Spend some mm. time painting and see what comes up. You're working with a therapist now? No, I don't have one right okay. now. Okay. Well, okay. But then I would say like, and then like explore that, right? Like what is that guiltiness? Like that guiltiness is you putting yourself first. Like fucking put yourself first. You deserve it. And you've already made a world like you've done enough. Like you're already net positive, right? How many people did you send to your amazing therapist who is life-changing? I don't know yet. I'm going to have to ask her. It's so like, I mean, if you, if, if you sent more than one, then you're net positive for life. Fine. So you deserve a break <laughs> and like do something for yourself mm. and put yourself first. And you've done amazing. I mean, Anita, you've just done such an amazing job, but like your positivity is infuriating me because it comes at the cost <laughs> of yourself. <laughs> And you're 90% there, but that last 10% has to come from like loving yourself and choosing yourself and putting yourself first. We're here on Twitch where everyone is so fucking selfish. And I don't think they are, by the way. I have a better opinion yeah. on Twitch. I sometimes wonder, I mean, I realize when you're saying earlier about, you know, Twitch and failure and all that, losing my income and all that kind of crap. I, I think, I mean, you must be right. And I can see that. And at the same time, there's a part of me that wonders about like how much of that is because of the way that you view the world. That if there's mm -hmm. love, there's going to be taking away of love eventually, mm -hmm. right? Like I see that True. same dynamic of like, when you look at Twitch, you're like, this is going to be temporary. The gravy train is going to stop at some point and they're going to abandon me. Yeah. Yeah. You, you don't know how on the head you are with that. My community will tell you as well, because when I first arrived, 
I went from in three months, I ended up with like 300,000 followers. Um, the first three months, like I went viral and it was scary, but I didn't get used to it. Everyone was like, you're a big thing now. I was like, no, I'm not. I'm viral. Everyone's going to go on to the next thing in a few days and everything will go back to 20 viewers again. And I just did not believe it. And I kept saying that any minute now, any minute now for like a year, I was like, any minute now they're all going to go and they stayed. And I've, I've been like, what? Like, this has been like brain scrambling. So I've not, I've, I'd never understood it. <laughs> Yes, and this is this is going to sound crazy, but like I think Twitch, like this is going to sound fucking weird. I think Twitch is teaching you how to love yourself, right? Because like this is exactly what happens to someone who's been in an abusive relationship. After abusive relationship, after abusive relationship, after abusive relationship, is they meet someone who's actually nice and they're like, what the fuck is going on? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, why haven't yeah, they, they abandoned me? Like, what is this? I didn't, I don't, this is not how things work. <laughs> People get interested in me in me for a time and then they start throwing rocks. Like yeah. where and then the longer they stay, the more confusing it gets. Yeah. And it's just bewildering because you weren't taught how this works. You weren't taught that you can have intrinsic value and that people can come around and hang around because they like you for who you are. I see it. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. And that, that is something that I, I've been genuinely confused by. And sometimes people have like donated thousands of pounds or they have, you know, they've, they've been following me for like 19 months and I'm like, why are you still here? <laughs> and I'm confused and I will openly express it. And I haven't quite learned how to come to terms with it yet because it is, it directly, it, it confronts something I don't know how to process. Yeah. So let me. I'll leave you with this to think about, and then we'll see. I mean, if you have other questions and stuff, but I want you to entertain a crazy idea, okay? I want you to entertain that people can see value in you without you giving anything to them. I want you to entertain the idea that sometimes you're the rabbit, that you don't have to give anything in return, and that people will just appreciate you for being you. Hmm. And that you don't have to adopt or save animals or other things to be like valued in life. That you can have, I know it sounds crazy, just intrinsic value. Not extrinsic value, but just intrinsic value. That just by virtue of who you are, you have worth. And that you don't need to do anything to be worth something. Yeah, that makes so much sense if I picture it applying to somebody else. That's the weird thing. Like yep. that's, that's immediately when you're describing that. It's easier to remember and understand those words if I'm picturing us describing someone other than me, which kind of emphasizes, yes, I think you're very much onto something. <laughs> yeah, right? And so I think you've got to explore that. And I think it's, it literally, Anita, it starts with little things. Like it starts like, I mean, when you say people don't say you have nothing on your walls, like, so get yourself something for yourself. Yeah. Like, do you have a bathtub? I do. Do you have bubble bath? No. Do you have things, do you ever use the bathtub and enjoy being in a bathtub with like bubble bath or other kinds of bath bombs or whatnot? No, I, I don't do that. Yeah. So I think you should try. Like, I think you should st start with petty and worthless indulgences. Because you're worth it. Thank you. Any last thoughts or questions? No, I just wanted to say thank you for everything that you do. I think that, honestly, I've, I've watched a bit of your work before here on the channel. And I think the beauty of it is that um, a lot of what's being described is very normal human problems. And a lot of people in chat can definitely relate to it. You're helping people process themselves and the people around them and contextualize behavior that they've seen or experiencing that they don't really understand yet. And I see that fitting for place, fitting into place for people in chat, um, people who've seen your work. I've heard them talk about just in the brief periods that they've dipped in, it just transforming things for them. And I think what you're doing is beautiful. I thank you ever so much for bringing this to the platform because it's definitely what's needed. Um, and yeah, I know that this is going to keep growing and it's beautiful. Well, I am. You're very welcome, and I greatly appreciate your positive sentiment. It's part of what keeps us growing. And I could say that I'm going to say the same thing right back at you. 
because I think you too bring a lot of positivity and wholesomeness. Like I'm not too familiar with too many Twitch streamers, but yeah. I think it's awesome how you engage in conversations around mental health. I think it's awesome how you try to be a positive person. I mean, I know we've been trying to get you to not be a positive person for the last hour, but <laughs> I really do think it's great that you you do try to make the world a better place. Um, and, and the world really does benefit from people like you. I mean, if we had a, you know, a hundred people like you, 10,000 people would be better off. I think the mm -hmm. only thing that I'll return to is that, it, and this goes for everyone else out there too, is that you don't, you should absolutely make the world a better place, but I don't believe it has to come at the cost of yourself. I don't think that but that's fair. Um, but I, you know, I think what you do is awesome. And I think that you're educating people around Tourette's and mental health and like teaching acceptance and, and all, all that kind of stuff. We're, we're completely behind you, Anita. Thank do you. you. Do you want to meditate? Sure. I teach people how to meditate. Let me just think about what, oh man, I, do you have anything? You must indulge in some ways, mm. right? Do you have junk food at home? I buy treats, put them in a box, and then feel good that I have them there, and then don't eat them. <laughs> okay. So do you have any treats at home right now? I do. <laughs> Can you go get one? Yeah. Go get one. Okay, I'm going to turn the camera off real quick. Sure. To go get it. Uh, is okay. it off now? Yep. So you guys yep. should try this too. Yep. Camera's off. Okay. Be right back. So we're going to do, for Mental Health Awareness Month, we're going to do treat eating stream. <laughs> so if you guys have some kind of junk food or something, go get it. Right? Shouldn't be, shouldn't be a, a big ask for, for most of our audience. And if you guys eat too much junk food, you can also go get, go get something healthy to eat as well. Go get whichever thing you get less, you eat less often. Like this. Okay, so I should be back now. Okay. So we, we, I'm going to, let's give people like 30 seconds to go get their own food. Okay. What did you get? I got some white chocolate. Awesome. It's unopened. Mm -hmm. See, that's the crime. Should have been over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've had it for ages. Is it expired? Or are you going to get sick? No, no, it's not expired. It's fine. <laughs> okay. So let's get started. So I want you to start, Anita, by sitting up straight mm -hmm. and closing your eyes. And I'm going to ask you to think out loud a little bit, okay? So when you think wow. about eating the chocolate, what comes up in your mind? Mm, I can already taste it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And does any kind of emotion come up? Uh, kind of like relief, I guess. Kind of okay. Like, uh. Okay. So what keeps you from eating it? If, if, you, if, if, if you can taste it and eating it brings you relief, what keeps you from eat it, eating it? What do you think? Hmm. I feel like I should be doing other things. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. Do you I feel, feel like, like you should be doing other things now? No, not after I chat. Okay. So the first, okay, so now we'll, we'll, so let's just zero in on that, right? So let's zero in on the acknowledgement that the reason it has been left, it, it, it is left uneaten so far is because you feel like you should have been doing other things. And let's also notice that for some reason, and let's not be jump to conclusions, that feeling doesn't appear to exist within you right now. Hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So now I want you to open the chocolate. Breakfast. Wow. Okay. I've opened it. And then take off a piece. Mm -hmm. Is it like a big, it looks like, I'm just looking at it. It seems like, yeah, perfect. Okay. So close your eyes. Okay. Think about eating it for a second. Does any kind of wow. resistance to come up? Tastes like your mother. Sorry. It does it does it what? Does, does it, it bread? Does it does anything come up for you? No. Okay. 
So let's just notice for a moment that as her mind becomes less occupied, the ticks increase. So that's completely <laughs> normal. So now go ahead and take a bite of your chocolate. Just notice how it tastes. Hmm. And tell us how you feel. Pretty darn good. <laughs> <laughs> good. <laughs> but shouldn't you be doing something else? Mm. Breakfast. Okay, now the feeling's coming back. How do I push it away again? <laughs> what is the feeling? Don't push it away. Um, guilt. Okay. So. Shame. Eyes opened. Mm -hmm. Guilt and shame came. Close the eyes. Notice the guilt and shame. Give them, don't try to run away from them. Give them your fullest attention. What do you feel? Like, I shouldn't be doing this. Okay. So where is that sensation that I shouldn't be doing this? Mm, I feel it like a squeeze. Wow. Oh, a squeeze oh. on my chest or... Okay. I, I feel like pressure. Okay. So you feel a squeeze and a pressure in your chest. So I want you to do is take a deep breath in. Feel that squeeze expand and then relax and let it squeeze you. Let it squeeze. Let it contract your chest down. And now breathe into it. And then let it squeeze. And then a third time. Feel it expand that squeeziness and then let the squeeze contract back down. Let it deflate. And now continue your normal breathing and notice what's happening to the sensation within you. I feel like it is receding. Okay. I feel, I feel like, I feel like, I feel like even just acknowledging that it's there helps me to kind of shut it down. Like it feels less powerful when I actually face it. Good. You know? So we're going to go to level two, take another bite and, <laughs> and anticipate, let yourself recognize that that guilt eyes closed. It's going to get stronger with your eyes open. Mm -hmm. Let yourself, let it come in. Right? Recognize that there's a part of you that is guilty and ashamed and that that part of you, that negative part of you deserves a seat at the table. You don't all have to be a wonderful person. You're allowed to be a negative person too. You're allowed to have negative feelings. We don't want them. We don't want you to run away from them. That thing is not hideous. Right? They're, they're, your whole life you've been taught that there are parts of you that are hideous. That needs to change. Mm. What's happening to it? So I'm just letting it be there. And it kind of feels like an urge, like, I'm like, okay, now you're done. Put it away now. Like, wrap up the chocolate, put it away. No, no, no. Like, that's my immediate urge. Good, good. So notice that part of you, right? And then tell that part of you that you're going to take a third piece of chocolate. And what you're going to do is this third piece of chocolate, you're not going to necessarily push the negativity away, but you're also mm -hmm. going to let yourself taste that third piece of chocolate and just enjoy it as much as you can. Okay. It gets to bark but you don't have to respond to it, right? You're not telling it to be quiet, but you're also not giving in to it. So the third piece, I want you to try to really enjoy, like really taste it. Pay attention to your mouth. Pay attention to the sensation of it. Pay attention to the way that it melts. Pay attention to the flavor, the sweetness, the enjoyment. Huh. We don't want to push away the, the squeeziness. You can breathe into it if you want to, but really try to just enjoy the chocolate. Like, it looks like it's good fucking chocolate. Guac chocolate is mm -hmm. delicious. Mm -hmm. And just be like, yeah, this is great. 
And the last question that I'm going to ask you, and you don't have to answer this the right way. You can answer it the wrong way. Is, mm-hmm. is it okay for you to do this? Is it okay for you to enjoy? Is it okay for you to not donate that chocolate to a homeless person? <laughs> Stop reading my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Is it? Is it okay to feel both answers? Yes. That's the right answer, actually. Right? Because I have the. Wow. I have. Wow. I have. Wow. I have. Wow. I have the mental answer and. I guess the emotional answer and they're both there. Yep. Good. So, so now, now we're going to come to a close with this practice. So just sit with both of those answers and see if you can find any emotional answer that resonates with your rational answer, right? Can, do you find any enjoyment within yourself? Yeah. So, so notice that too, right? We don't necessarily want logic versus emotion. We want emotion versus emotion. We want you to recognize that there's a part of you that enjoys this experience and there's a part of you that doesn't enjoy this experience. Yeah. That actually the emotion that you feel is a judgment for the enjoyment. So that's actually more of a rational process than I think you give it credit for. Yeah. So there's emotion versus an emotion, and then there's rational thought versus rational thought. Judgment versus, yeah, of course it's okay for you to enjoy something. And then down here, there's a sense of tightness, and there's also a sense of, like, enjoyment or pleasure. Yeah. And, Anita, you must do this. Okay? So you pick whatever it is, whether it's buying something for yourself. And, and understand that one day you may adopt a child, or maybe you'll adopt half a dozen, because why adopt one when you can save six people, like? And then understand that one of the most important things that you can teach those children is how to appreciate who they are and how to derive enjoyment from life. Yeah. Right? And how are you going to teach them that unless you know it? That's very true. So do something for yourself. Do like you're going to notice it's like, I don't know if you go to the grocery store because of COVID or whatever, but you're going to have a a chance to indulge yourself and then you're going to rebel against it. Mm-hmm. But but support that part of you that bought the chocolate. That's the one that we want, right? Because in that moment, it was like, yeah, I'm gonna get me some chocolate. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so support that part of you because that that part of you deserves a seat at the table too. And and mm-hmm. spend some time painting and notice how you feel about yourself. And even if you can't delude yourself or trick yourself into doing it for yourself. You can trick yourself into doing it by telling you that you're actually doing it for the child that you're going to adopt one day. Yeah. Right? But do this. And for people who are at home, if you guys are way too indulgent, you can do the same exercise with something that is not good. I mean, that is good for you that you don't enjoy. And just pay attention to what happens in yourself. But anyway, thoughts or questions before we wrap up, Anita? No, this has been really great. Thank you for everything. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to someone who is just so aware of their internal environment. Um, and and it's been awesome. And I think you're just an amazing person. And it's been a blast talking to you. Thank and you. It, well, if you want to talk I'm again, ready. we can dig into why the fuck this whole relationship thing and what you're afraid of there. sure like that's a whole i don't even that's a whole other can of worms but i I mean i'd love to help you understand that you deserve to be loved and committed to by a particular person you know like you deserve that too like you deserve to be put first by someone i yeah thank you yeah anyway so it was awesome thank you very much and um stay safe you too have a great evening Adios. Bye, chat. Bye. Okay. We did meditation. Okay. All right. So, um, let's think about. Okay. So, guys, a couple of recaps. So, first of all, so Anita's amazing. 
And let's remember, I want you guys to be careful, right? Because Anita is so positive, but like that comes at the cost of herself. And that's not something that we want, right? Like we want her to like, you know, it's just not fair. It's not fair that she should sacrifice her own happiness, her own wants for the sake of other people. Is it noble? Absolutely. Is it good? Absolutely. Is it fair? No. Right? So like, let's remember that the way the world works is... We sacrifice for others and others sacrifice for us. That's how dharma works. So I think that it's amazing what she wants to do. But then like we should, and she's doing a good job. And I think apparently Twitch chat has taught her this, is to, uh, taught her how to receive, right? Which is amazing. Like, let's just, let's not forget that that's, that's awesome that you guys, like, think about this. Everyone thinks Twitch chat is toxic, but y'all aren't toxic. Right? You can be toxic. And this comes back to Anita saying, can I feel both of them at the same time? Absolutely. There's a toxic fucker in you and there is a wonderful, wholesome person in you. There's AOE healing and there's AOE damage, right? That we are both things. That she can love her mom and respect her mom and be grateful for her mom and also resent her mom for being incapable, right? That's what kids do. Kids blame adults for all kinds of irrational shit. That's how kids operate. That's why they're kids. They're like, wah, daddy, like, why does the sun have to go down? I don't want to go to sleep. Why can't the sun stay up forever? Fuck you, dad. Like, that's what kids do. But I don't get any of that from her. And it's okay to be, it's, it's, there's a difference between being rationally upset with someone and being irrationally upset with someone. And like, it's okay to be irrationally upset with someone. That's what most of being upset is. It's irrational. It's not logical, right? So it doesn't have to make sense and you don't have to dismiss it. You're allowed to feel the way that you, you do, even if it's completely incompetent. Now, should you let it dictate all of your actions? No. But I think this is where Anita gets into trouble is she does let it dictate her actions, right? She lets the relentless positivity dictate her actions. She lets the fundamental premise that she is worth, worth less than other people dictate her actions. And it looks so beautiful on the outside, but it's not fair to her, right? And what's awesome is that Twitch chat has, has taught her this. Like, you guys get this? You guys got her hat. Like, you guys got her there. Well, probably a therapist who is life-changing has something to do with it. Let's be fair. But when it comes to people who subscribe to her or stuck around or, you know, sub for like 21 months or whatever like you guys sent her signals that were contrary to her worldview which is that people leave and that people don't have value or that she doesn't have value and and that's amazing so i believe in the the healing power of twitch chat and also the absolute toxicity of twitch chat i know you guys are capable of both that's why it makes it makes it fun um so listen this has been fantastic i you know it was so interesting because when i when i talk to people who are so capable and so awesome i always struggle with the sense of like whether i can help them in some way not that i need to right it, but like anita has come so far but i want her to see that take that next step right i, I really want her to and and um oh wow i need to donate a thousand dollars wow thank you very much anita um and yeah, I mean, I, th I think like this is what we've got to do. So this is what we want to do, right? So this is what we're doing right now is um, we, are, we are doing Mental Health Awareness Month and we're going to help people. And the way that we're going to help people is through our recovery coaching program. And what I'm trying to do is teach people to like talk to you guys and help you like figure out what is holding you back. Because this is crazy. Just think about this for a second, right? Anita is such an amazing person, and yet she is still holding herself back. And the way that she's holding herself back is like, uh, do you guys hear that when I asked her, like, have you thought about having kids? And she has this whole, like, rational, justified response that is in response to something that she feels. Like, I can't have children. Like, there are a thousand questions that I want to ask her. And at the top of the list is one that I think is incredibly hurtful, but I think she's got to explore which is, was she an unwanted child? Like, what's going on with, like, her being an unwanted... Like, where does, where does it come from? It infuriates me that she has to feel that way, that she feels that way about herself. It's not fair. She, she shouldn't need to feel that way. I mean, I don't know that we can do this, but we're going to try. So we're going to try to train coaches, or we, we have trained coaches, and we are... It's actually pretty good. I'm understating things. 
So we collected data for eight weeks and we saw that the coaches can actually help people. So we're going to do this, right? Because here's the problem. Here's what Healthy Gamer is about. She asked me, why did I start streaming? So I'll tell you guys. And this is why we're trying to raise money. So if you guys subscribe or donate or whatever, like, thank you very much. This is, this is what we're about. So two years ago, I, I posted on Reddit. I said, I'm a psychiatrist who's interested in video game addiction. Ask me anything. Post hit the front page, a lot of great responses. And then people started reaching out to me. And I was like, oh, fuck. People think like, oh, this isn't that wonderful. That, oh, like, oh, you're famous. Oh, Harvard. Oh, oh my goodness. Front page. Oh, so wonderful. I was actually terrified. My response was abject terror. Because what I heard from people over and over and over again is like, help me. And then I said, I can't. And then the next person said, help me. And I said, I can't. And the next person said, help me. And I said, I can't. And that happened like literally a couple of thousand times. And then I was like, oh, fuck. There is a huge problem out there. And like, no one knows. Amidst COVID going on, I want you guys to think about this for a second, okay? When COVID happened, we tweeted out, we said, how are you guys dealing with COVID? And the response that we got is that it's actually not that bad. It's not very different from my regular life. And so my first thought was, oh, that's pretty cool. Like people are more adaptive towards, um, you know, COVID because they're gamers. But then another part of me like jumped up and, and thought something really horrible. The rest of the world is falling apart because they're quarantined and we live like this every single day. That COVID quarantine is a way of life for our generation. That is fucked up. Just think about that for a second. It's not that we're more, like, the fact that we're adapted to COVID is fucking terrifying. Right? That there's a growing population of people who lives like this day in and day out. The rest of the world is fucking falling apart, and we're like, what the fuck is wrong with you guys? Just stay at home. Oh, you can't get your nails did? Like, who the fuck cares? Right? But there's a generation of people who lives in quarantine their whole life. We heard it from Anita. She was agoraphobic for years, right? The world is a dangerous place. We don't want to live out there. And what I heard from people was even more disturbing was that I, I went out and I saw a psychiatrist. I saw a therapist because that's what everyone says. Like, oh, you're, you're fucked up. Go see a psycho. Like, get fixed. You're ill. You have depression. It's an illness, right? It's an illness. It's not your fault, man. It's an illness. It's just something's wrong with you. Like, your neurochemistry's fucked up, man. It's not your fault. You're just something's broken in your brain. Go and get that fixed, and then you'll be fine. And they do that. They go and they see a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist talks to them for 45 minutes. He says, yeah, you have depression. Because they check their DSM checklist, right? We have a checklist of things that, okay, if you meet five out of nine criteria, you have depression. Sleep. Change in interest. Guilt. Lower energy level. Concentration, appetite, sluggish, and suicidality. If you have five out of nine of those, you're depressed. And then they give them a, a pill. And they, gamer, reject, lifelong quarantiner, goes home and he takes his pill and he says, ha, 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 I'm fixed. I'm cured. And then they log on and they play video games. And then the next day, ha, ha. I am cured. I'm going to take my pill. Take their pill every single day and they continue playing their games and nothing changes in their life. And then these fuckers reach out to me. They're like, can you help me? Because you seem to understand something that these other people don't understand. And I'm like, oh, fuck. Why did I start streaming on Twitch? It's because of oh, fuck. It's because when Anita was at the meat market as a child, she saw a rabbit that was in a cage that was going to get butchered. And so she tried to do something about it. Y'all are my rabbit right? I see the rest of the world not doing for us what we need. I see a mental health system that is too old. The average age of a psychiatrist in, in America is like 55. Too old, too slow. How long does it take to get an appointment? Oh, three months. Do you have three months to waste? In a sense, yes, because you guys aren't fucking doing anything. But in a sense, no, because if you're like a sophomore in college and you get F's for three months, your academic career is ruined. And it's too expensive right? How much does it, I mean, my hourly rate is astronomical and I see a lot of people for free and that's why I charge an astronomical rate, but it's expensive. Health insurance is expensive depending on where you live. Wait times are super long. They'll see you for 12 sessions. We've heard horror stories. Who was it? Ingrid a couple of weeks ago or like one week ago told us the story of how she went to see a psychiatrist. She was waiting for 45 minutes 
into her appointment. The guy talks to her for five minutes, says, I can't help you, and sends her out the door. Like, what the fuck? The mental health system is not meeting our needs right now. And it's so much more than just mental illness, right? There are like so many problems. Like we don't have forward momentum. We, we rack up tens of thousands of dollars of debt for jobs that pay us $25,000 a year. Like something is fucked up. And, and you know, I don't, I don't necessarily think it's our fault. And so what, are, what am I going to do about it? What am I going to do about it, right? That's the question. Like, what am I going to do? This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to start streaming on Twitch. And then the number of people that ask me for help increased. Now we get thousands per month asking for help. So what the fuck? Like, what am I going to do about that? Or am I just going to say like, oh, I'm sorry, I can't help you. I only have 24 hours in a day. That's what I did for a while. And then I felt bad about myself. I was like, I have to do something. Like, I can't just say, no, I'm sorry, I can't help you. I got to do something. So I was like, okay, fuck. So we're going to start training people. And like, can I teach people to help other people? That's where our coaching program was born. Because I don't think that streaming is enough. Like, I know that AOE healing is awesome. And I believe that people get healed, but it's not enough, right? We got to do something about it. And so this is where our coaching program is born. This is why we have a Discord. This is why we have a community. I found out recently, this is amazing. So I didn't do any of this. This is our mods on Discord. They deserve a lot of uh, props too. So there's like a cleaning hour where people log onto our Discord and they clean together for an hour. We talk about our emotions. We talk about our feelings. We talk about all this kind of stuff. There's a coding workshop. There's a book club. Because here's the thing. The world is not going to help us right? We've learned that. Like, it's not going to help us. Like, the world is not filled with people like Anita. If the world was filled with people like Anita, you guys wouldn't need to do shit. Because you could sit around and do, give life the 10% that you give it right now, and Anita will step in and give you guys 90%, and y'all will be fine. But the truth is that they're not going to give you 90%. I can't give you 90%. I can give you 20%. I can give you 30%. And it's not fair. It's, fair. it's not fair that it's 50-50. It's sad. But we're going to do it, and you've got to do it too. So you've got to step up. You've got to take the time to get help, right? So that's why we're doing the coaching program. And we have way more people that want to be coached than we have capacity right now. So we're going to train more people. We've, we've had thousands of people who want coaching and not all of them can pay. So we're going to try to make it affordable. And that's why we're doing the stream because some of y'all are broke, which is fine. And we don't want to be an organization that turns people away due to, I mean, probably we will because we'd go under in a moment, but. You know, that's why we're trying to do stuff like this. That, you know, I, I try to, I mean, our retreat in 2019 was free. I don't know that we can do that again because the treat, retreat may be way bigger this time. I don't know when we're going to do a retreat, but it's one of our stretch goals. I absolutely want to do it. My whole fucking team is like, you can't do this, Dr. K. You can't open your doors to the internet because you don't know who's going to show up. But there's a part of me, the troll inside of me is like, yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can do something absolutely crazy because that's what streaming on Twitch is. All of my colleagues who were psychiatrists said, oh, you can't do this. You're going to get sued. So I hired some very expensive lawyers and they wrote me a lot of disclaimers and then we'll see. So that's what we're doing. It's Mental Health Awareness Month. So become aware of your mental health. Show up here. We're going to be doing some fun stuff. We're going to be doing some educational stuff. Probably a balance of both, right? So we're going to do a lot of fun stuff. And um, we may, we, maybe you guys will get learn, learn something. Maybe you guys will be healed in some way. And, um, you know, that's the goal. And then if you guys really want to, uh, yeah, um, join in. And all of your donations and, and subscriptions and stuff really help. I, I'm, I, by the way, I, I actually should just express my gratitude there because... People like Anita and Lily Pichu and all of you guys who have been do donating and supporting us, I just want to say like a genuine thank you because I was funding the shit out of my pocket. Now like I, I can start contributing to my retirement and my kids' college funds and things like that. So thank you guys very much um, because it's great because now I don't, it's so awesome to not have to worry about paying my bills at the end of the month because I'm streaming instead of seeing patients. And I'm really, really grateful for that. And I want to do more. But I realized also that like I can't do it alone, right? I can't fund everything by myself. So that's why I'm just eternally grateful for like every little bit that you guys give. I know it doesn't seem like a lot, but no snowflake believes it's responsible for the avalanche. But 
we're all a bunch of fucking special snowflakes, right? So let's make a fucking avalanche and let's like let's make a difference. Let's support each other. Let's help each other out, and and let's try to make the world a slightly better place. And let's game while we're doing it. Okay. So, I love you guys, Avalanche Pog. Absolutely. You guys get that AOE healing is an avalanche, right? One snowflake is not AOE. An avalanche is AOE snowflakes. It's AOE. That's what's so great about it. All right. Okay, so we're going to raid. Let's raid. Um, so I think... Uh, Okay, so you guys want to raid, we're going to do an exercise stream, or, hold on, one second, the wife, hello? Yeah, okay, all right, all right, uh, exercise stream, what do you guys think? Yeah, let's, let's raid Anita, right? So let's send Anita some love, because she, you know, um, and then, yeah, so what we're going to do is, <laughs> so I, I've been told, um, can I let you guys, guys in on a little a secret? So sometimes, apparently, when I ask for money, then what happens immediately is I raid someone else. And so I've been told for my team that when I'm, when I'm asking for money, I should give you guys time to donate before I send you guys away and end the stream. <laughs> my team is so mad. Oh, I'm so bad at this. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, Twitch, I need so much help. I'm such a boomer. Boomer! Boomer! Okay, so this is what I'll ask. Can you guys, if y'all are going to subscribe or donate or whatever, like, please go ahead and do that. And then let's raid Anita, because we right now have almost 10,000 viewers and she has only 1,500. So let's blow the fuck up out of her stream and send her some positivity and, and send her some AOE healing and like break, like not give her fucking psyche a chance to rec to, to think that she doesn't have value. We're just going to send her such a gigantic mother load of avalanche snowflake love, affection, and value that we don't want her fragile psyche, which believes that she doesn't have value, to be able to withstand it. Right? Let's just crit heal the shit out of Anita. And just crit heal it and crit heal it and crit heal it. Doesn't matter how just just crit heal. And and send her some love. And hopefully you guys learn something from it. And you guys are still subscribing, so I'm confused. Because I, I can't raid. Okay. Subscribe next time. They're my people are gonna crucify me. But if you guys don't subscribe, we're gonna we're gonna end it or donate or whatever. In five seconds, it'll be too late, and we're going to lose out on money, but who the fuck cares? Because right now there are a lot of people, and y'all are positive, so let's go do something with it instead of milking you for money. Go send people. Send love. Do it. Be a good person. And clean your room and exercise and, like, reflect about yourself and recognize that you, too, have value. Don't fucking lose that. Right? Send her some love because, oh, yeah, you guys, so you guys are doing the same fucking thing where she's like, yeah, I can see that other people have value. But I don't have value myself. You don't do it yourself. Don't just get away with sending her love without sending some back this way, right? Self-love. Self-love, fo folks. Okay. We're, we're, we're out. We're going to raid. So if you guys didn't subscribe or donate or whatever, no big deal. We'll be streaming on Wednesday. And thank you guys very much. Crit heal Anita. Crit heal the shit out of her. Thank you guys very much.